All right, this is Frank Yosan. I've got Nate Berry here with Wild Health, and he works with NFL players. Uh, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Frank. I appreciate you having me. Uh, I always enjoy our discussions every time that we talk. I think we're both obsessive about, about performance and, and how we can tinker and, and, uh, and experiment and, and make things better. So I always pick up something new, and I always appreciate our discussions. So excited for this one today. Yeah, yeah, I'm real excited. But you guys actually do more than NFL players, right? Like what, what different sports do you work with? Yeah, so I work for a company called Wild Health, and we are a genomics precision medicine company, and that's a, that's a mouthful, um, and we, we deal with the, the whole spectrum of, of individuals, but it's really personalized medicine, and we're trying to use subjective and objective data points to really drive our decision making, and the more details and the more information that we get about an individual's blueprint of truly who they are at a cellular level, uh, the, the better that's going to be. And so we deal from chronic disease to high performing CEOs and, and people in the business world um, to uh, obviously NFL athletes. And I'm the, the director of athletic optimization. So we actually have a, a host of athletes that we deal with um, in terms of minor league baseball teams that we work with um, here pretty soon, a, the USA boxing team. Um, so we, we deal with all sorts of, of different athlete types. Great. Yeah. I was particularly interested in your NFL players, but you, you have, you know, many other players and you work for the individual athlete. So you actually go across multiple teams. So you don't, you're not just uh, a consultant for one team. It's more athlete, athlete driven, right? Yeah. Very athlete driven. Like we are, um, yeah, obviously their medical group that takes care of their health. Uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll have conversations with the teams to support that individual every way that we can, uh, even away from the facility in the off season. Um, so, uh, but yeah, very individualized focus. Great. And today we want to talk about ketone esters, particularly in the NFL, but maybe other sports as well. And I hope that this video can be something that you could actually send to prospects that you're recruiting and say, hey, this is one of the things we do, ketone esters. So for that audience that might be brand, brand new to ketones, I'm just going to do a real high level recap. Uh, the ketogenic diet, which is similar to Atkins, is when you eat 80% fat, 15% protein, 5% carbs, your body goes into this mode called ketosis, where it burns your fat to make this emergency fuel source called ketones. And what the ketone ester is, is basically bottling that emergency fuel that the body makes. It skips the fat burning stage, unlike what the competitors try to make it claim. Um, it skips that fat burning stage and actually releases this emergency fuel. Uh, and the body can run on glucose or it can run on ketones, but it's just a different, more efficient, uh, like coal burning, slow burning fuel, as opposed to a kindling type uh, glucose, which creates you know, spikes and crashes. And we currently have supplied 80% of the Tour de France teams because they tend to be at the forefront of all of these athletic performance advantages. But it has so many more applications in NFL. And you mentioned boxing and we can go into, you know, all of those different things. So let's, uh, let's get into it. Um, so how did you first hear about ketone esters and, and how did you determine that they worked? Was it just the science, reading the science, or was it actual real life use cases? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think it's a little bit of both. I mean, obviously the, the science around ketones and obviously the benefits for ketosis. And I guess the, the avenue that we went down was really for the, the neuroprotective side of, of ketone esters. Uh, and then the more we started exploring, obviously the, the, uh, the benefits of just ketosis and has that has on the body from a, a multitude of benefits, I think just totally makes sense for our NFL athletes. And I think even with all of our athletes, their their schedules are so energetically demanding that every strategy we try to bring in has to has to check a lot of different boxes. It has to be time efficient. It has to do more than just one thing. And we're we're trying to obviously give them something that's that's time efficient. That's going to make a a big effect on their performance. Um, and so for our athletes, a, a ketone ester is a staple. 
I think for especially more of the strength and power athletes that we deal with, it's impossible really to, to maintain a ketogenic diet year round and maintain their level of performance from a body composition standpoint, from an energy standpoint, from um, maintaining a strength and power throughout a competitive season with that stress load. And so just bringing the benefits of ketones with a product like ketone ester, it gives us a multitude of, of benefits and we, we adapt it with our protocols um, to, to, to truly magnify uh, all of the benefits that it can produce. And we can obviously dive into that yeah. later, but, yeah. um, but I think uh, it was just a no brainer. The more research that we did, obviously the, the, the host of benefits that it just, it's a truly a staple of all of our athletes and, and what we supplement with. Well, let's talk about, before we get into specifics on the protocol, the number one thing I like to ask is how have you changed their diet? Cause diet is really key to really yeah. nail that down first. Do you make them keto? Do you make them keto off season? Do you make them low carb during the week? And then game day, they bring back in sugars. Like the gambit is just, <laughs> it's just huge and varied. So what do you guys do? I'm dying to hear. Do you make them all go keto? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, obviously, the genetics and, and getting their, their genetic blueprint is a big one for us. Um, just those, those variations, those genetic variations really can, can give us a further depth of information of truly what makes sense for that individual and what they evolve genetically to best uh, match their genetic potential. Um, so we use genetics, we use blood work, we use their current diet, uh, we use their kind of subjective input. We also look at their demands that the sport has on their body for performance to drive our decision making and creating the best diet for them. And there's a lot of fluctuations in that. There's a lot of, uh, you know, seasonal dependency, day in, day out, microbiome makeup. Um, so there's a lot of factors that go into, into our diet decision making, but especially for if we're talking about our NFL athletes, um, I, I think we all know the benefits of, of ketosis in, in a keto diet for brain health, but it, it just, for those individuals, they can't live in ketosis year round for performance sake. And, and about 50% of our guys, like keto diet does not make sense for them genetically for, for their genetic potential. And so we kind of flex for ketosis um, so we bring in the keto diet post-season. So we usually go about three to four weeks right when season ends because we're not worried about body composition. We're trying to get the, the brain to heal from a, a long season of months of uh, just the, the obviously the, the brain damage that they go through and the, the, as a contact sport, it's just the, the cost of playing the game. Uh, but for, for in season, off season, we, we, we don't do the, the keto diet, if that makes sense. Well, let's, let's not make some assumptions. I think I would think 90% of the players probably don't know about the benefits of ketones for the, for the brain. So let's, let's right. back up to that for yeah. people that might be first timers, either playing football or NFL, and don't know about the neuroprotective benefits of ketones either exogenously where you drink drink it out of a bottle or endogenously when you make it yourselves so what have you seen in the research as far as brain health for people that are exposed to you know consistent brain injuries yeah so i think a big one that we look at is uh, a lot of times we see uh, in tbi it's um so traumatic brain injury it, it it creates a energy deficiency and it, so it starts to kill the neurons and even that like the CTE buildup over a course of a football season that's going to be more magnified if they're in a energetic depletion so I think when you bring in ketones it obviously supports the neurons at the mitochondrial level so it's going to give it that energy support that reserve of energy so it's not killing the, the neurons through the course of a season with just the, the, the constant contact uh, and repetitive uh, contact to the brain. Right. Uh, well, also, the, the, the neural inflammation is a big one. Um, it, it supports, so we use it, 
We use it post game. We use it, you know, post contact practices is a big one to support that neural inflammation. Um, another big one is I think it does really balance GABA. Uh, and I think the, also the other thing of TBI is that it increases a, if I have this correctly, it, it overproduces glutamate, which is that excitatory neurotransmitter of the brain. Uh, and the ketones really help balance that and increase GABA. So we're also getting benefits from sleep, uh, relaxation. I think uh, a sport, any sport, you're going to increase dopamine, which makes it really hard to come down off, to, off of a competitive event uh, and relax the body. Um, so, in, and most of our athletes are dopamine dominant. Uh, so they need that balance of GABA uh, and they need that increase of GABA, especially in a, a post-game uh, environment, just to get them to calm down and relax after a game is, is a big one. And we'll talk about the R13, which would be perfect for that in a yeah. second. Uh, yeah. The one way that I've I've described it previously, which might give a different perspective, is that the, the brain, absent a ketogenic world and absent exogenous ketones, the brain has a brain energy gap, which is only a certain percentage of the brain can be fueled by the other fuel that's available, which is glucose. And right. some people that brain energy gap is, you know, 3%, tiny amount, but other people, it can be 20, 30, 40%. And taking more glucose doesn't just make up for the void. It just can only take a certain amount. And then ketone esters and ketones bypass that blockage that it's like an HOV lane to the brain where everyone else is stuck at a toll booth. And it fills that gap. Now, if you're at 97% and you fill the gap to hundred, you, know, you might not notice a 3% difference, but when you're in the 70, 80% and you are able to break through to 90%, it can be very, very noticeable. And I remember the story of someone at a conference three or four years ago, I gave him the tiniest amount, maybe $2, $3 worth of ketone ester. And within 30 seconds, he did this slow, awkward look up toward me. And I said to him, what position did you play in football? And he goes, how'd you know I played football? I said, People who react as quickly as you do oftentimes have, you know, played football, have had, you know, traumatic brain injuries over the time. And he's like, yeah, sure enough, he had played a, a, a particular position. So everyone else won't just have their lights turn on like that. But for people that are in this void and don't even realize it, it can really help. And that can help acutely. So someone who's just had a brain injury. But also over time, if you've had 20 years exposure to it and you haven't played football in 20 years, you still probably have a glucose metabolism problem. And that's where I would say get a blood, keep blood glucose meter, continuous blood glucose meter, put it on your shoulder. And just watch what you eat for a couple of weeks and just see for yourself the skyrocketing and maybe even see correlations to the higher the skyrocketing blood glucose because you ate certain things like fruit. And people, you know, think fruits organic and great for you. Yeah, but it can also spike your blood sugar. And, and you might see direct course, direct correlations with brain fog and, you know, start changing your diet, not necessarily going keto. People think that that means going the other extreme keto. No, there, there's something else, which is just a low glycemic index food. You want to get your carbs in great, but just don't skyrocket them. So they skyrocket, you know, off the meter. Uh, have you guys made that blanket statement to most people that, you know, regardless of, your genomics um, and whether you're going to take ketone ester or not, just do you cut out the high sugars, the, the juices, the fruits, or at least put the fruits at the end of the meal so that you don't get as much of a spike versus the beginning. Do you have any baseline rules that go to everyone as far as sugar spikes? Yeah. When we, we try to uh, stay away from, from sugar as much as possible, because even though it's quick energy, there's, there's a high cost to that energy, meaning, I think uh, sugar, especially processed sugar, especially like the juices, the Gatorades, things like that, like they just rob the body of essential minerals. Uh, we see a high cost on the, uh, the peripheral tissue. So the soft tissue, um, we see the, the negative brain effects. Um, so I think there is a high cost to those sugars and that's the, the beautiful part. Just the metabolic benefits of the ketone ester is that we can get the um, the same energetic effects from the ketone ester that we would get from sugar, uh, but without the negative uh, cost to the to the sugar, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think. Have, have you seen with we, we've seen with the ketone ester a little bit of negative effect, which might come in sprinting. 
So right. like if you were doing an all out, just one, you know, Hail Mary pass, yeah, sugar might win and glucose, I mean, glucose and sugar might win. Whereas the ketones might be at, you know, 98%, but then you can keep it all freaking four quarters. And, right. you know, you might not be at the hundred percent, but when, when you're at that 98% in the fourth quarter and everyone else is down in the nineties, low, low nineties, that's when it makes a, you know, a much bigger impact. But what about, so people in the keto world, let me ask you about this real quick about sugar. Yeah. People in the keto world, we refer to sugar as anything that's high glycemic. So we count sure. rice, bread, pasta, but in the regular world, they hear sugar and they think white cubes in their coffee and they say, okay, I won't have sugar, but then they go off and eat fruit. They go off and eat rice and bread. And they say, well, it's not sugar. So where do you land on, on guidance on carbohydrate loading and you know, loading up yeah. with pasta the night before? Yeah, I, I don't think the, the benefits of, of carb loading is, is what people think. Um, and, and we do bring in some high glycemic carbohydrates if we need to, but we try to limit it because even for, for muscle protein synthesis, we have to optimize insulin. So we have to stay insulin sensitive. Uh, so if we're always carb loading and always getting these spikes, you're going to get that insulin resistant, which is going to be a detriment to, to growth hormones and things like testosterone and obviously muscle protein synthesis. And so obviously it's a, it's a balance and it's all about timing and especially looking deeper at the individual to understand how they metabolize carbohydrates. So there's some nuance there. Um, but the, the ketone esters again, and, and being, uh, bringing in the, the ketones can, and help maximize um, some of the energetic benefits with, without spiking the, the insulin. And we are able to optimize insulin a little bit more efficiently. And just going back to what you said about kind of the game, like football, for instance, is it's all about repeat sprint ability or repeat strength and power ability. It's more of an alactic aerobic sport. So what we've seen is truly the benefits in the fourth quarter is that we're able or with our athletes to outlast most because we, we have that, that capability to, to, to maintain those energy and those outputs in the fourth quarter. And also we're seeing that line up at the end of the season well. So late into December and early January, we're, we're maintaining our, our speed and power and strength numbers by using something like the ketone ester. Right, right, exactly, yeah. And um, let's talk about oh, the other use that you mentioned was being able to get off of caffeine, which was the unintended yeah. use that I kind of knew about for for helping nurses and doctors get off of caffeine, you know, using ketone esters, you don't have the spike and the crash. But then when you brought it up, I was like, Oh, how'd you know about that? Um, so let's talk about protocols. What do you guys do? Uh, or what do you recommend during their workout week? Is there a certain amount that, that they're of KE4 that they take pre workout? Do they slow release it into their water bottle during the workout, post workout sleep? Do you have a routine? Yes, we do. Um, and it's, it's a little bit different for every person, again, genetically, um, also demands of, of their game. Um, but, you know, currently, for instance, we're in, um, uh, we're, we're in OTAs right now. So we're, we're using them right now uh, to run a few tests for season. Um, but a lot of them usually spend their off season in a, a different location. So when they, they travel, they're usually coming into a different time zone. Their routine is disrupted. So when that happens, when there's just a greater level of stress, we'll start to bring in the ketone esters to be able to support that level of stress and also increase their performance, especially as there's a new adaptation or a new stress imposed on the body. Uh, and it, it improves the adaptation rate, the recovery rate. Uh, it really improves sleep, which we talked about. Um, so we're going to use it, you know, depending on the individual to kind of drive the, the timing and the dosage. But right now we're going to use it for pre-workouts. We're going to use it post-workouts, especially if they're, they're doing practice. Not, not a lot of teams do any contact during this time of year. Um, so we're not even getting much brain inflammation as we would have in season, um, but definitely using it for the recovery benefits, making sure that we're, we're maximizing our time with OTAs especially practices and lifting sessions. And that we're also getting the, the sleep benefits from the, from the esters as well. So um, as far as quantity, I mean, some people take as little as five mLs and other people chug an entire bottle. And this is also supposed to be based on muscle mass. So the bigger you are, 
So I would think that the, you know, these big, huge players would have to take at least 15 mLs on an empty stomach at the beginning or what do you, I know there's a range, but what's the lowest and what's the highest you've, you've had yeah. people stick with. Yep. Um, so we do use a little bit of, um, of fructose. So we go a low glycemic fructose, like berries, like blueberries in combination. Sometimes we'll use something like honey. I don't think there's a lot of costs. And actually there's probably more benefits, um, from honey than the, than the actual cost of the sugar on the body. Um, but we'll com combine that with a little bit of a carbohydrate intake. And for our big guys, we'll go 30 mLs pre and 30 mLs post. For some of our skill guys that are, are more of an energetic demanding positions that are a little bit smaller, we'll do 15 mLs pre. We'll do 15 mLs at the halfway point and then 30 mLs post. Um, and that's usually our, our pre-game uh, or excuse me, our game day and practice or exercise kind of protocol. Well, that, that's perfect. When I, when I heard you say 30 before and 30 after, I was wondering, well, what about re-upping? Those people don't necessarily re-up in the middle? Sometimes, um, okay. not all the time. Okay. Um, it it kind of depends. If they feel like they need it, we'll, we'll give them 15 mLs at the halftime. Um, but if, you know, if they feel like that it's supporting them throughout the game, um, but for those big guys, we haven't seen much of a need, but again, at times, especially later in the season, we do see a need to bring it in at halftime. Um, but especially in the off season, we, we, at the halfway point, we don't from a practice or a, or a true like training session. Um, so. Well, one, one of our products is snake water was kind of designed to have a slow carbohydrate in it. And I remember you needing me to FedEx. I won't say <laughs> where it was, but I can, I, I can say it was in the playoffs, NFL playoffs, where I needed to yeah. FedEx to, uh, to a team overnight because he forgot his snake water. And when we made it happen, we got it down there. Yeah. Um, and that product has been, we've been sold out of that for four or five months as we started selling our new drink, the R13, but we're bringing it back next week in a new and improved version. So that one kind of has already built into it a lot of the, you know, you could use that instead of the fructose and the, and the honey and, you know, see how that works for them. One yeah. thing with the fourth quarter thing, which I've been just waiting four years, basically to talk to someone like you to confirm it in real world situations, there was a clinical trial that we did where there was, they were going to be doing soccer sprinting and they wanted to, you know, see whether it improved soccer sprint numbers. And I said, you know, maybe it'll make them faster towards the end versus the beginning, but I don't see it helping with that. So while you're at it, why don't you test their brain? And they're like, oh yeah, sure. Easy enough. And then two years later, when the paper came out, the title was cognitive improvement using ketone ester and, you know, in shuttle run testing. So what they found was that the ketone ester group, the brain was what had the significant improvement. It had the same baseline scores as the beginning of the workout versus the glucose based, uh, the group that was doing glucose only, they actually had twice the number of wrong answers. So there was a significant difference in, in just your brain at the fourth quarter. And I said, yeah, this is having a fourth quarter quarterback have his brain or anyone as sharp as the first quarter will just be just a monumental, huge, huge difference. And I'm glad to see that you're, you know, seeing that real life. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, go back to a point that you made earlier uh, about, you know, maybe decreasing speed, to be honest, like we've used it on testing in some of our, our NFL athletes. And we haven't seen like all of the, the testing outputs have actually increased in speed, power and strength while on the ketones. Um, so we, we haven't seen that, that loss of, of lactic capability or lactic outputs at all. Uh, so I don't think that you're going to get a detriment of, of the, the lactic qualities uh, and at benefit of the, the repeatability and the, the aerobic threshold. Um, so I, I think there's, there's multiple benefits on that front. I well, think another area that we've seen too is um, just the, the, re the reduction of anxiety. I think with the, the increased levels of, of GABA and adenosine, I think have, have provided the anxiolytic qualities that we truly look for, especially I think a lot of athletes, and we talked about this earlier, completely overdo the, the overstimuluses. They, they just completely overstress the HPA axis with 
uh, with caffeine. And a lot of our, our guys, probably 70% are not good caffeine metabolizers. And that's something we look at at the genetics, like if, if, if caffeine truly is going to increase their athletic performance or not. And a lot of our guys don't, um, but that's just such a big part of the culture of, of using caffeine and just getting to that amplified state. But I think there's also a high cost to that, especially with anxiety. I think you're going to get a, a detriment to performance if you take the body to that level and your body doesn't metabolize caffeine well, uh, especially with recovery on the back end. So we've seen a, a huge benefit just in the, the anti-anxiety properties uh, for the mental performance while we're in game um, by using things like the, the teacrine instead of the caffeine in combination with the, uh, uh, with the esters. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the, the snake water is, yeah. has a teacrine and it also is going to have dynamine. We're adding dynamine um, sure. in, in this version. Um, so yeah, the, the ca- I'm not a fan of caffeine. Uh, I think caffeine is a drug, even though certain do- doctors say, oh, only one or two is fine. I still think it wrecks your sleep. I think it wrecks, you know, cortisol spikes and adrenal glands. And everyone just wants to believe what's easier, which is that the Starbucks coffee is somehow good for you. Okay. And, you know, people say, oh, but I need my Starbucks. I need my coffee. I need my ritual. Okay, great drink decaf like it'll take you 40 days either use esters or don't it'll take a while to get through it but once you actually get through to the other side you'll find that it's it's a false sense of energy it's not real energy you might have felt energy with caffeine the first time you took it 20 years ago and you're literally chasing that high that just doesn't happen anymore get rid of it don't have the spikes don't have the crashes get better sleep and you know maybe one day we're we'll have a product that is actually a coffee decaf only that has ketones in it to really help you kick that that caffeine addiction um but yeah the fact that you guys are able to use you know remove using caffeine game day for an nfl player i mean that's just that's huge and unheard of that's like you know that's going to take a while for some people to to believe but to be able to do that yeah i think it's i think it's great giving you more consistent energy and and keep you more towards the end even if you try things like you know l-theanine yeah sure that'll help the jitters some but you're still trying to counteract a, a, a drug um so do you guys take any before bed after a game like what's your before bed protocol during the week and then game day yep before bed um so we'll bring in uh, the ketone esters before bed on the let's see thursday friday and saturday we'll bring in 10 mls is kind of the protocol currently i think the discussion lastly you actually said maybe it was might even be better to go 15 mls if i remember correctly. oh i would i wouldn't have gone well it depends how hard the workout is so with the tour de france people will take an they will take an entire 50 60 mls before bed like crazy high amounts but if i if i'm currently keto so i have some baseline numbers you have to also watch out for the cumulative effect of if you've taken a lot of ketones that day you actually might not want to take any at night because it can still multiply what's already in there but if i go from five mls and i take seven mls 10 mls it can it can wreck my sleep but if i had done a you know a long workout whatever that would be for me and i'm more wrecked then you can take more it's almost as if it's more of a signaling molecule and it it's the molecule is cleaning up all the damage first and then it, you know, becomes an energy source. So if you take too much, I mean, my wife once I got up at midnight and I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, Oh, I took too much ketones before bed. They kicked in and now they're, she's all, you know, cleaning the closet. Um, (laughs) So, you know, we had to drop her down by like 75%, but these Tour de France people, they're so, so wrecked that they can take higher amounts. So the 10 mLs for someone of their weight seems about right. But if it's a you know post game where they're just wrecked, then you could, if you know that they could drink three cups of coffee and still go to bed, then great, take it up to 15, 20, and maybe even maybe even 30 for some of the bigger you know linebacker guys. You know, they could take a lot more on on the wrecked days. Now, during the week, as you get closer to the game, you got to watch out because if you're tapering off and you're not having a hard workout then you have to you know, make sure that you're still on the five to 10 mLs. Um, but if you guys have a one particular hard workout a day that they're just zonked, yeah, you could pop it to 15 and, and even 20. And you'll know when you've taken too much when your sleep is more shallow. So right. you're, 
when, when it works, the deep sleep goes up, but when you take too much, it's just a shallow sleep as, as, as if all night you've got like half an eye open. You just, you, you just took too much more is not better. Cut it back down. Um, great. Yeah. And you know, yeah, so immediate, we, yeah. Go ahead. We, uh, so we, we actually ran a few tests in the off season. Like we'll use the aura ring and the whoop, um, just as a, a testing mechanism, um, just to get some, some objective feedback from some of the strategies in the off season. We actually don't use Aura uh, or Whoop or any uh, biofeedback device in season. Um, and we can talk about that if, if you'd like, but uh, what we kind of found is 10 mLs was a good place for, for improving sleep for our guys. Um, so that's kind of what we landed on based on the, the tests. And, and to be honest, all every time we, we bring in an ester in the off season and we're wearing Auras or Whoops, uh, HRV um, spikes uh, with with all of our guys so it's a it's an interesting um better recovery better yeah. recovery spike yeah yeah and do they prefer the ke4 that one athlete had the snake water are they okay with the taste uh do they do any of them do the ke1 because the ke4 is a little too harsh or you just make them so, suck it up uh, a lot of them we do the key four um there was just uh two of them that we did the snake water with um but i mean obviously the the taste is is not great but they're 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 for function, not fashion. Like they can, they can go through some uncomfortable uh, circumstances for performance and it, and it never got a, a complaint from, from anybody on the taste. So, Oh, well, that's good. I actually thought that they would have been more just used to sugary drinks and just <laughs> might give you a hard time. Like, Oh, what's this thing? I'll just sure. go over there and drink some of that, you know, other sugary stuff. Um, sure. uh, any other protocols for other, other sports that you found, you know, maybe the the athlete is a tennis player, much much lighter than a football player, yeah, or like the, anything different uh, for other sports. I think with our with our baseball players, I think just the uh, the cognitive benefits, like in game, obviously as kind of a, a nootropic, like the focus, like the visual acuity that they get over the course of a long game like that, right. has been been a game changer uh, for those guys. And I think one of the discussions that that we had that uh, that you brought to my attention is that that you feel like the ketones are almost a magnifying agent yep. to some of the other supplements. And we, we bring in some other uh, nootropic uh, compounds as well for visual acuity and, and focus and reaction time with our baseball guys. But in combination with the esters has been, has been awesome for them. So. Uh, yeah. With, with baseball, I, I really think that um, pitchers, if they get this dialed in, we had one, uh, I think it was, professional i don't know if he's you know one notch down from professional where he threw his fastest ball in what two or five years the first time that he took the ester you know in practice and i said wait a second it's i would have thought you need glucose for speed and he started listing the benefits and one of them that he went down was he seemed like he was more flexible and i said aha that's it you created the the rubber band effect you got an extra one inch two inches of stretch and that is what led to led to the increased speed. And another thing that the ester kind of does mid game is it's not necessarily so much what the ester does, but it can help you skip eating a meal during that, during that long baseball game. And eating that meal is what destroys you. So right. like just allowing you not to, I mean, baseball is so just sit on the bench for such a long period of time. And then you decide to eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because you're hungry. And that just wreaks havoc. And then you, you're, you're mush. Like you don't realize it, but you're mush the next inning. Like what happened? Yeah. It was that peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So by having ketones as an appetite suppressant as well, so you can not eat the entire, you know, long game and just get a, a good amount of not, not too much, but a decent amount of ketones in at once. You know, part of it is just not having that crash from the food or glucose based drinks. Yeah, and I think that's a big one too that you kind of hit the nail on the head there, Frank. And that's a hard part about travel with our guys because they're they're so regimented when they're at home and the routines are are so finely tuned that there's just so many small things that we try to optimize and there's no way to replicate that on the road. And we're we're trying to come up with better strategies to get them better quality food, but the the food takes a major dip in quality and um, just the not having to rely on food all the time for energy uh, has been a, a big plus. Yeah. Food I, I say is overrated and we I've gotten some pushback from some athletes that want to eat. Um, there was one 
another soccer trial and they had to feed them all before taking the ketone ester. And I said, well, the ketone ester doesn't really work as well on, you know, with food beforehand. They said, well, well, it's just typical that a soccer game, it'll be nighttime soccer game. So they're going to eat a big meal before the game. And I said, well, why doesn't someone test that test whether that's a good idea? Because it probably isn't. So you're, you're bringing over these protocols and trying to apply the ketone ester to a wrong protocol. So you, if that meal probably doesn't have enough time to turn into energy for the game. So what are you really doing? You're actually eating that big meal and taking a lot of energy to break down that meal for the sole purpose of not having a hunger twinge at the beginning of your workout. Well, what if you just took the ex- esters, didn't have the hunger, hunger twinge, didn't have your body wasting all of this energy, breaking down that food and giving you a, a spike and a crash. So I, I question the entire default protocol that, you know, these people have for either running a marathon or, or a hockey game or, or soccer. And it, it, it changes. I think it really changes everything. And it's hard to do clinical trials when the baseline itself that you're comparing it to just isn't right. And oh, there's also race strategies for, like for cycling. If you normally have to kick at exactly four minutes at the end of the race. And, you know, if you kick five seconds too early, everyone knows that you'll you know, blow out your energy with the ketone esters race strategy changes. You actually have to leave two minutes early, five minutes early, and people laugh at you for going out too early, but you can only hit 97, 98%. You can't hit the hundred percent. So you have to actually do the math and say, well, how early do I need to go and how fast, how much ahead do I need to be in order for them not to be able to catch up? And I've gotten, you know, photographs of people who have won across the finish line at these major European cycling events. And I asked the doctor, did they go out early? He's like, yep. And they were making fun of him. And here he is, you know, at the end, he just, no one, no one could touch him because he's at that 98% longer. So um, have any of your athletes noticed the, the time dilation effect, which can happen in like tennis and baseball where things kind of seems like the ball's two miles per hour slower, five miles per hour slower. Uh, Have they ever reached that point? Yeah, I think just um, uh, subjectively, like the just the the cognitive benefits um, for cognitive performance is kind of what they speak to. But that could be kind of the 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 same thing that you're speaking about here. Uh, they just didn't know how to articulate in that in that manner. Yeah. Uh, but all of them have just the um, anecdotal data uh, of just saying how 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 good their, uh, their focus was just things, you know, um, just seemed to click well, like it was just a, a, a huge mental performance as well. And I think that speaks to, you know, as kind of an oversimplified, uh, metaphor, but if we can increase the, the computer's hardware, right. The brain hardware, it just makes, even when they are truly working and developing the, the software, the more of the, the psychological performance, it's going to be able to, to interact better with a, a higher quality hardware, and it's going to make the, the software work more efficiently. So um, from even just the, the mental benefits, and, and you know, as well as anybody knows all of the mental benefits of, of sport and how well that can play into, into overall performance. And this is probably one of our strategies that we get a, a major benefit from that standpoint. What have you seen with CEOs that you work with? Um, yeah, and that's and protocols as well. Are they taking it first thing in the morning? Are they taking it to skip lunch and breakfast? What yeah. how are they using it? Yeah, so a lot of our CEOs they like to do the the intermittent fasting um, for a number of reasons. Is usually they're you know high stress individuals that you know are probably a little bit. Uh, insulin resistant, that their diet is not as optimal. So a time restricted window goes really well from the, the cognitive benefits and obviously the cognitive load that they're under, uh, while also keeping kind of the body composition um, and the, the total health. And so a lot of times they'll use them in the morning. It will uh, not only for a cognitive boost, but also to delay their their kind of morning window to noon, one o'clock, and then they'll um, they'll kind of have that shortened feed, feeding window. So that's a big one for our kind of CEOs and our, um, our high stress work individuals. Yeah. We had one CEO who, uh, didn't see the point in the ester because he was, you know, firing on all cylinders with his brain. But then I found out that he only schedules his appointments 
before noon. I said, well, why do you do that? He's like, oh, well, I'm just more on at noon. And like, hmm, so you're not on later in the day. You didn't tell me that. What do you do afternoon? Oh, I have lunch. And then you crash, right? It's like, yeah. Like, well, what if you took the ester instead of lunch? First of all, you pick up an hour of work, like you know, of the workday, you just get an hour or half an hour back. And he started doing that. And he now doubled his productivity because he was able to at least uh, double the number of meetings that he could schedule because he started scheduling them in the afternoon because it was that lunch, again, that food creating the detriment and just skipping that food is half of the battle, let alone you know adding the ketones. So, you know, using that to skip lunch as well makes a CEO, you know, super, super efficient. Now, ha have I shown you or have we talked about the, the new R13 seltzer that, that our sister company, Hard Ketones, has done? Have you seen that? Yeah, so uh, we actually, we sent some to our NFL guys um, just as a alcohol alternative for in season. Uh -huh. uh, I think that could be a, a great strategy and will be a great strategy for them. Um, especially on, on Sunday post game, instead of, um, instead of having alcohol with the high cost of alcohol, um, bringing in something like, like your guys' product, um, you know, just having and two of those or three of those, and you can kind of get the, the relaxation benefits and, um, you know, with obviously, uh, not the, the hangover and, and the, um, the kind of the, uh, the double-edged sword of, of alcohol, right? And the massive benefit of skyrocketing your ketones, you know, for the right. recovery. Have they given you any any feedback? Have they been able to get off of alcohol, regular alcohol, or or drinking less? Or were they able to feel a buzz? Some people do, yeah. some people don't. What's the feedback been? Yeah, it's been a, kind of a, a very subtle light buzz. Um, yeah. They they like the flavor. Um, they they think it just tastes like a, a normal seltzer um they, they used it on like a, a friday night and it was just a, a calm relaxation mode for them um and they they all reported back that they they really enjoyed it so i think that's a, a strategy we'll definitely use in season great so just to recap on this drink what it is is half of the molecule of the ketone ester the ketone ester is two molecules together beta hydroxybutyrate otherwise known as ketone itself and then r13 butane dial when you consume it, it enters into the liver in the ketone ester form, and then it separates through enzymes, and then you get immediate re release of ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate, and then you get a slow release of this R13 butane dial that goes through the liver and creates more ketones. And I asked the scientists many years ago, well, why not just give people R13 butane dial? Because then they can you know, turn into ketones and would cost a lot less than making the ester. And the answer was that the mice were stumbling. So you know they got drunk, they got buzzed, and they just threw that out. Now, obviously they're drinking super high quantities of it. And we, we initially gave this drink to people to try to work out. And they said, Frank, you know, I don't think you have a winner here because I drank it before my workout and I'm on the treadmill and I see a couch and all I could think about was sitting on the couch and relaxing. So it like, it doesn't give that amped up pump. Um, well, not that the ketone ester gives you pump, but it's more compatible with that. Whereas sure. the R13 kind of is more post-workout, post-game. But they could use the R13 equally as effectively, I think, after any workout or after any game immediately to be able to have that you know, relaxation while skyrocketing the ketones. And it costs less on a per gram basis. But I wouldn't do it pre-game or, or during the game. Um, and right. right now we have, so we had the seltzer. We came out with the gin and tonic. Not sure if you've tried that. And then I have, um, yep. just now we launched a mule. So we're doing a ginger oh. mule. And hopefully within a month, we'll have the Holy Grail, which is the beer. That's what we've been <laughs> looking for, a gluten-reduced um, beer that's also low-carb and you know, can really be that, that everyday um, drink. Any, uh, anything else with the NFL players? Um, how many of them do you, do you have on a ketone ester routine? Uh, we have 10 of, our, 10 of our guys on the esters. Uh, okay. So uh, quite a few of them. Is it, um, is there anybody that it didn't work for? And it's completely fine. Like didn't work for this person because it made them lightheaded or they couldn't get over the taste. There's gotta be some. Yeah, no, uh, we had, we had one guy that, that tried it and, and felt like a, a little bit of a um, uh, gut inflammation, um, just a poor gut response. Um, and so he was a little bit nervous to try it again. And, you know, obviously don't want to push them or mix or mess with their, their performance. Uh, so that was the, the only one that we got a, a poor response from. 
Yeah, we haven't seen many, you know, GI issues. He might try the KE1 to see if that's um, a, a little bit less. It's just a little bit less. It has six times more water, so it's more dilute. And, you know, the water shouldn't matter for the GI, yeah. but it's just a, a different makeup. And sometimes, actually, some people, we made the KE1 have just monk fruit, whereas KE4 has stevia and allulose. So sometimes people have allergic reaction to those, you know, those sweeteners. So that's why we, we, we switched them up. It could be single-handedly that he didn't realize that he's allergic to, to stevia or allulose. So it's very possible that the KE1 uh, uh, would work there. Well, yeah, that's, a, that's a good thought. I appreciate that, Frank. We'll give that, a, we'll give that a test with him. I think you guys are nailing every single protocol just like perfectly. Um, and you're, you're not overdoing it because people tend to think more is better. Have you ever had any problem with someone, you know, chugging an entire thing and, yeah, I think with, with all of these guys is, um, and that's kind of, you know, especially if they're super motivated and they, they see the benefits and they get these benefits, they always think more is better and they want more of it, more of it, more of it, right? So we want to make sure that it's usually my job to kind of pull them back and truly kind of outline the best protocol. Um, and, and a lot of it is we want to get, especially from a, a strategy like this, um, we want to get all the magnified benefits in season. Um, so we try to make sure that we, uh, we don't go too hard in the off season, but I think July is a big time that we like to use it as well that I didn't speak to earlier. Again, talking about building that energy reserve of the brain before we go into season, okay. especially because there's no way to mimic contact in the off season with their off season preparation. So going from zero contact to all of a sudden a lot of contact going into training camp, uh, it's a, it's a big transition. Um, and so building that reserve going in from July into August during camp is, is a big part of uh, the benefits that we get from the ester as well. But I think just speaking about all the protocols and kind of the areas that we use it, it just it goes to the multitude of benefits and how adaptable that an ester is that um, you can truly mold it, adapt it, um, come up with a multitude of protocols to, to get a lot of benefits. And um, like I was speaking about, just from a, a time efficiency standpoint, um, I mean, we try to do everything as well as possible. Um, if how you do one thing is how you do everything, that's kind of what we do with performance. But the, the esters is kind of a, the higher, because, you know, some things obviously are, uh, have a bigger role in performance. And this is kind of one of our, our, our big uh, performance drivers. So let me ask you two other products that you, if you use them, do you use anything with uh, sodium bicarb? To, you know, either pills or anything with the ester. Some of the Tour de France people are playing with that. What, how do you use that? And do you find benefit with the esters and just, you know, by themselves? Yep. Yeah. So first season, um, uh, this last year, uh, or I'm sorry, two years ago, we, we started this with the esters. Now we're starting to throw a little bit of sodium bicarb in there. Um, the reason for that, we're seeing a lot of our athletes are very acidic from just the, the protein intake. And a lot of them were previously, uh, before they came to us, they were eating a lot of um, tropical fruits and, and they just, with the amount of high intensity exercise, they tend to be a little bit more acidic than most. Um, so I think that from an energetic benefit um, and then the, the benefits out of Peruvate, I think the sodium bicarb has been a big protocol, um, especially with kind of our, our hydration. We, we usually, do our hydration protocol with the sodium bicarb 90 minutes before uh, exercise or performance or practice. Um, and then we bring in the ester about a uh, 45 minute to an hour um, timeline before exercise or performance. You take the ester 45 minutes before performance? That's where we've been kind of just, okay. just in terms of timeline for when they can use it within everything that else they have to do for game day. And we try to mimic game day throughout the practice season or throughout the, the practice week. Um, so that's the, what we have found to work well. Um, but any, any feedback on that, we're, we're open to it. it. It seemed a little bit on the long side because it really can start working within 15 minutes. And the closer to the game starting, if you move everything 30 minutes, you'll have maybe 30 minutes more utilization. But, but try it different ways. I mean, sure. if whatever, you know, you guys find, you know, works best, but with the bicarb, you said you, you pour in the actual powder, which is just baking soda into their water drinks. Do they take any pills, sodium or potassium bicarb 
pills as well? Um, so we do, we do a pill. We don't do, um, uh, we just take it with kind of our, um, our, our high sodium solution and high electrolyte mineral solution. Uh, but we take a pill, it's, it's sodium and potassium bicarb combo. Now with the KU1, we, that also has um, high amounts of salt in it, the sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, and it also dilutes really well. So you could take one or two bottles of KE1 and put that into a, a larger water bottle that can be slow release, get your electrolytes also yeah. while getting ketones and basically taste nothing. Like when you put that in, in a water, it tastes like maybe a, a peach has been squeezed. Um, yeah, so and the other product I want to ask you about for... is Lactigo. Do you guys ever use Lactigo? Are you familiar with Lactigo? I'm not familiar with Lactigo. Well, I will, I will send you information on it. Uh, you could, it helps with... Uh, if you have motorcycle riders, the, their arms get that you know, lactic acid pump, um, basically making lactic acid significantly decreased in you know, runners or anybody that has lactic acid uh, buildup. And right. I've just been, you know, we might do some stuff together where we, where we sw swap products for each other's customers, sure. but I've gotten a lot of really good feedback in that. That might be something to, uh, to take a look at. Yeah, absolutely. I'm uh, I'm excited and always uh, always pick up something new from you, Frank. So I, again, I always love our discussions and our conversations. So this is awesome. I'm just so thrilled that your protocols are just on on point. Now, game day. What do they do game day as far as if they have a three o'clock game? Are they eating breakfast? Are they eating what 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 time is a typical game? I guess you got nighttime and and then weekend daytime games. Yeah, it's it's all over, um, you know, especially as they uh, travel to, to different time zones and, and everything. And sometimes it's it's early morning, sometimes it's evening. And, and so we do some circadian rhythm um, optimization and, and some phase shifting within the season just to maximize that circadian rhythm. And I think there is and you can correct me if I'm wrong, some benefits to the esters. For yeah, I was going to rhythm function. Yeah, yeah I was going to mention. Yeah, for traveling, if they're doing flights over two hours don't eat on the flight and take uh, five to 10 mls before five mls every hour get through the flight and helps with the radiation and um, just the the jet lag that they normally get with with flying part of that is that food so encourage them not to not to eat at all um, uh, but going back to just kind of our, our game day routine oh, yeah. is, is usually we'll eat um, kind of our, our meal uh, four hours before okay um, so we try not to eat too close um and and a lot of times you know nerves obviously play a role with just obviously the the digestive function so and it's just kind of depending on the position again of how much the kind of the quantity but we just make sure that it's uh super nutrient dense that we get you know some fat some protein some carbohydrates fiber rich carbohydrates they don't spike insulin too much we'll start the hydration protocol 90 minutes before. Um, and then we start kind of our, our game day protocol is um, like we talked about um, kind of in that, that 45 minute range. Perfect. And do you guys ever play with having the athletes put on continuous glucose monitors, either game day or off season, just to kind of see, oh, wow, you, you're tanking at, at the third, third quarter. Maybe we should do something about it. Yeah, it's hard in football to, to do the CGM, especially in a contact sport. Yeah, um, but I think it's it's worth trialing in something like baseball um, if if they don't get too much discomfort. Uh, I, you know, I'm always cautious that we don't bring in some sort of uh, external factor that will cause them brain uh, energy and brain bandwidth that will have some sort of cost on their performance. So I'm, I'm always I always like to do that stuff in the off season. We definitely do those tests in the off season yeah. and just try to get as much data input as possible so we can make better decisions as we get in season. Tell me about the, the baseball team or stadium that you guys are sponsoring, or is it an entire team or a stadium that you guys are yeah. going to be? Yep. So it's a, it's called, it's a, it's a ballpark here in Lexington. It's called wild health field. So the Lexington legends played there previously. They just added a new team. And so we got naming rights to the team. It's the, the uh, Lexington Genomes, obviously, for uh -huh. a genetic-based company, which is kind of fun. Um, so they're new to the Atlanta League this year. Um, so we also take care of the Legends 
medically as well as the genomes and the uh, the Charleston, West Virginia dirty birds. Okay, awesome. And what I'd like to hear from you in, in six months with with uh, pitchers, whether you've found a way to use the ester to just allow the pitching time to increase, like the number of innings, whether you can do two back-to-back -back days or whether you do seven innings one day, but then the next day you can only do three. Right. I think nailing the way that the esters are, are used for recovery can really, really help them. I would be scared, however, if somehow it overexerted them and they felt great and all their numbers were great, but then, you know, somehow after a month or two, it cumulatively, you know, backfires, but uh, I think they can keep an eye on it and find ways to use them 25, 50% more, you know, by using the esters. Right. And that's the, the, the balance point that we talked about, Frank, because, you know, when you take the body above its, its physiological limits, you know, with some uh, endogenous compounds like, like the ketones, um, you, you have to play the balance game because if you do that for too long, um, the body's going to wear out and break down at, at some point, you know, whether yeah. that's a weak point, if that's in the, the periphery, um, if that's just, you know, from a, a complete nervous system standpoint, like it's just, it's got to be balanced correctly. Um, so you don't, you know, obviously recover them so much that uh, it just, it just, and they feel like they're Superman and then just completely wears them out uh, because, yeah. you know, we yeah. see, see people do that often um, and they, they will break down at some point. Yep. Yep. Exactly. All right. Well, anything else I, I missed that we should cover or any, any product well, that you want us to launch any? Yeah. I'm, I'm any excited. Particular... That we'll, we'll have a, a lot of back and forth and, and a lot to, to continue to, to mold and, and talk about. And, uh, you know, I just uh, appreciate you and uh, making such a, a great adaptable product. Um, so, you know, obviously you're, your work and everything that you do allows us to, to perform better and kind of live out our dreams. So we greatly, greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's